we're in lesson two today. If you're viewing from home, we're in lesson two of the uh, foundations, Isaiah part one. Hopefully you all have a lesson book. And uh, <clears throat> it says we're studying Isaiah, but we haven't reached Isaiah yet. We are, uh, <clears throat> I think there's an Isaiah part two coming up later on in a year or so. What I think is going on here is we're sort of getting a view of uh, trying to understand prophets in the Bible. I think that's what we're doing. <clears throat> Before we begin, we'll look at, um, and Gene, you give me a signal if I don't talk loud enough. I think the volume up is up on the microphone, so we'll try to, let me know if you can't hear me. I'll try to give me a thumbs up. I'll speak up or something. <laughs> I tend to get monotone, I know. I get talked to about that a lot. Before we begin, we'll open up with prayer. Um, Read his home. I know the cannons are out right now. Susan, Richard, Richard Johnson, you talked to him at all? Larry, Larry might be working. Um, <clears throat> anyone that we need to include in our prayers. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be gathered here today. Call upon your name and study another portion of your word. And we pray that uh, the things that we say and do here would be pleasing to you. Father, we ask you to be over our sick. Help us uh, protect us from <clears throat> these viruses that are flying through the air. And uh, may we continue in good health if it be your will. Father, we pray that we would look to you for things for eternal life. That your word, we understand, sustains us. May we look at the lesson here this morning. Look in the book of Samuel and understand your will for mankind. For it's in Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to start reading again in a second. Uh, well, there it goes. Today we're going to be looking at uh, <clears throat> Samuel, and you'll see on this chart here that he is uh, <clears throat> really going to be the prophet we see before. Uh, we look into the kings that he's going to anoint. And uh, so eventually we'll see, and we looked at this when Michael was teaching. <clears throat> we also looked at this where he uh, is the advisor, you might say, in the background of, uh, Sam, or, uh, of uh, Saul and, and David. And then at the end there, we, we saw the last lesson that Michael taught the adult class last semester, we see Nathan really coming in and advising David. So there's the prophets. Uh, as normally as we do, we're going to read the scriptures that are set up before us. And uh, we're going to ask Gene to do that if I can get the right controller here in my hand. Start with Gene, is it okay? And then we'll go to Evelyn. Samuel leads Israel to victory. Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, If you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods, your image of Ashtar. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. <clears throat> so the Israelites got rid of all their images of Baal and worshipped only the Lord. Then Samuel told them, Gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpoth in a great ceremony, drew water from a well, and poured it over the Lord. They also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. It was Mizpoth that, that Samuel became Israel's judge. When the Philistines ruled, heard that Israel had get, gathered at Mizpoth, they mobilized their armies in advance. The Israelites were badly were badly frightened and gathered together and went up against Israel. 
And when the children heard, they were afraid of the Philistines, and the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto Jehovah our Lord for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And Saul took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering unto Jehovah, and Samuel cried unto Jehovah for Israel, and Jehovah answered him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But, the, but Jehovah thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines, and discomforted them, and they were smitten down from Israel. And the men of, men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Heather to hath Jehovah help us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more within the border of Israel, and the hand of Je Jehovah was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Brekrom, even Goth and the border. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and great, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointing. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I impressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hands. Samuel said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and also his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your forefathers up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here, because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous, righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said, if I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go out into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time, the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed towards you, will I not send you word and let you know? Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot of reading. Uh, and as you see, we're skipping from 1 Samuel chapter 7 to chapter 12. And in chapter 20, and the verses we just read in chapter 20, again, is sort of a closure to the lesson we had a couple weeks ago on David and Jonathan and how they were friends. So that last part of it, as I studied this, I couldn't really fit, see how it all fit in. But I think that we're looking at an overview of how Samuel uh, worked as a prophet in the Old Testament. <clears throat> We stated this last week, too, and I'm going to be following along closely with the lesson book. So we're in the introduction, and uh, we looked at this last week, and we talked about it, and we're going to say it again, to remind us how God speaks to us. And of course, the application today, and I think I asked this question last week, is how does God speak to us today? And uh, it says here that in the last days, he speaks to us through his son. And as we know in John, as the gospel of John opens up in the next hour, I'm going to lightly touch on that. John says that Jesus is the word. And so it kind of fits together. 
In the Old Testament, and we kind of looked at that last week, we took talk, looked back, and we're going to cover a little bit of it again. Uh, God spoke to us through his fathers, the fathers of the uh, Old Testament, and then the prophets. And uh, this King James says divers, but it means different ways. Uh, and that's always the key here is the application is that we need to listen to God and his word. And we'll see here when the people don't, uh, they continue to suffer. In your lesson plan here, it also talks about <clears throat> where Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of a private interpretation. And what's that mean by private interpretation? And you might have a different rendering of that. Anybody come up with any ideas there? What it means to be have a private interpretation? I know you know Michael. Go ahead and tell me. Because he sat back. Because I can just see you. In other words, you don't get a dream in the middle of the night and say. Peter's saying here, God spoke to me this way. But Mary didn't get that dream. <clears throat> These things are in the scriptures. We are to understand them. They're clear. Yes? I can add to it. You know, when uh, Paul writes about the, uh, the spiritual gifts to the church in Corinth, and he's in 1 Corinthians 14, he talks about it. They're there to prophesy you make sure that it is verified by two or three other people. So right. the, the idea was it's kind of a check and balance to make sure what we are being taught is correct and that it's accurate. And as you said, God doesn't reveal something to one individual and not tell others. Right, exactly. And the idea here too is that, thank you for that, is that these people are moved by the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter says there in that first uh, verse. In other words, I think we miss this often. Even when we look at the Gospels, we're going to talk about that today. These men were told to write by the Holy Spirit in some form or fashion. And those gifts aren't here today, but they were in the first New Testament because the Bible wasn't written down. We know Moses was given the gift of, of spirit to write as he wrote the first five books. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, or this, God goes on to say in Numbers 12, 6, that you'll know my words, you'll know the prophet, I will make it known to him in a vision, I'll speak to him in a dream. And then in Genesis 26, God said to Amalekic in the dream, if you remember that, we looked at that a couple, maybe a year ago, don't bother Abraham, he's a prophet. In fact, he's the first prophet we see in the Old Testament. And if you touch him, you will surely die with sort of the warning. Okay, so we're kind of establishing the idea of prophets here again. Where are you reading from? Uh, on page 10, actually, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 8, let's see, well, I'm going into Deuteronomy 8, 15, but Numbers 12, 6, God instructs how the prophets will understand things through dreams and visions. And we see that in the Old Testament. Uh, Jacob had a dream. There's all kind of those things going on. Okay. Then, in, uh, still on page 10, it talks about um, Jehovah the God will raise up a prophet in the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. <clears throat> and thou shalt say, we know the word which the Jehovah hath spoken. And it, that's a question. When a prophet speaks the name of Jehovah, if it follow not or not come to pass, this thing was not which Jehovah hath spoken. So again, we're trying to understand the authentic, how authentic these words are, these prophets are. 
Paul speaks about this in the New Testament. We're to test the prophets by the words and the scriptures, and uh, we're looking for consistency. So these same, same things are going on in the Old Testament. And that's what we're covering here on page 10, this introduction. Okay, everybody with me so far? And up on page 11, we're going into, by the time Samuel arrives on the scene, Israel had been, has been ruled by several judges over four centuries. And, and the reason I kind of like these series is uh, a few years ago, we went through judges. And the book covered, if you weren't here, the book covered several of the judges, but you can look, read judges, and it covers those. Uh, we, we looked at Moses. He was actually the first judge. He was sort of a judge and a prophet. So they would bring people in front of Moses, and he would uh, judge. Now, he wasn't a king. He was a judge. And after these judges came through, and we're going to look at Samson in a second as a comparison. I threw this one in. Uh, the nation of Israel starts spiraling out of control, I believe your commentary says here. And in Judges chapter 21, 24 through 25, <clears throat> I think that's in your notes here on page 11 also. The nation of Israel departed. Every man to his tribe and his own family, they went out Every man to his own inheritance, and those things. There were, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did which was right in his own eyes. And we quote that scripture often as we study the Bible, because isn't that what we see today in the world? Uh, we, as Christians, as ones that fear God would judge ourselves according to the scriptures, but a lot of people just do what's right in their own eyes. Any questions or comments, just yell them out. I tend to get going. So here we go. We're establishing Samuel. So Samuel ministers unto Jehovah before Eli. Who's Eli? He's, okay, he's high priest. He might wouldn't even be kind of looked at as a judge before Samuel, because we're going to see this in a second. This priest, this judge, uh, king, these are all kind of blended together at the moment. And so he's ministering to Eli. And the word of Jehovah was precious in those days. There was not much frequent vision. And we see this uh, between Malachi and Jesus. There's like 400 years of silence from God. There's different periods in the Bible, and even in Judges, there's gaps where there seems to be silence from God. And, and this is what we're seeing in this situation. And is Samuel, First Samuel opens up in these few chapters. We dip in in chapter 3. And the lamp of God was not yet gone out. Still in the introduction pages here. <clears throat> Samuel was sleeping, and he's by the ark, and he, he's uh, waking up. So he gets, hears something, a vision, kind of like what we just covered in these verses. And God said to Samuel, Behold, I'll do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that hear it shall tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. So God's telling Samuel he's going to judge Eli, this priest slash judge. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sins did his sons did bring a curse upon themselves, and he restrained them not. So 
Eli's being judged for things his sons do here. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expatiated. Is that right? <clears throat> With sacrifice nor offering forever. So God's done with this priest and his hypocrisy. And it was judged that Eli loved his sons more than God. And there's one of the lessons that come through here is this, the heart. We're going to see that in the heart of Samuel. And he failed to submit. Eli did. His pride. <clears throat> so again, the Lord was, <clears throat> was precious in those days. In other words, it was rare. There would be many speakers for God. But there's a revelation here from God to Samuel or Jehovah. <clears throat> Either term is correct. And there's a memorial set up for the ch Jewish nation and that so-called church there. This is all in your commentary here <clears throat> for both the Jewish nation and the church. And we see Samuel here is going to be a founder of prophecy. And he's going to set up a new institution by God that we haven't seen before. And he's going to be, this is towards the bottom of this commentary, this idea that he's actually going to be sort of a king, a priest, and a prophet. And in your commentary it says he became both unique as a judge and a prophet. And so that's kind of why we're taking a look at Samuel. He grew. God liked his heart. He listened to God's word. He obeyed God's word. None of God's words fell to the ground. And all of Israel, 1 Samuel chapter 3, 19 and 20 says, all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of Jehovah. That's sort of the introduction of where we're at. So quickly we're, bring, we're kind of brought up to speed who Samuel is. And I think that's interesting, uh, in my own opinion here, is that often we read Samuel or we get to the book of Samuel, we sort of don't understand the context of how he got on the scene. So we had a series of judges. I think Eli was like the last one, sort of act as a priest too. They were intercessing for the people to God. Uh, we have a high priest too. But this priest started failing, and so God moves in with a new priest, prophet, and we're going to see almost a king, uh, Samuel. Samuel the prophet. <clears throat> now we're in the first section. Samuel <clears throat> the prophet on page 12 of your commentary. And we're going to cover 1 Samuel 7, 3 through 14. So now we've moved up to 1 Samuel chapter 7, if you want to follow along in the Bible. <clears throat> and a little background here. The uh, nation of Israel is, in, is at war with the Philistines. One of their enemies, again, and this is a group of people that weren't extinguished by Joshua when they came through Canaan. It came to pass in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2, that the, the Ark of the Covenant abode in Cathra Jimera, Jerim, that they were a long time, 20 years it was there, and all the house of Israel lamented after Jehovah. Lamented would mean they were crying, they weren't happy. And Samuel arrives on the scene, 7-3, and spake 
to the house of Israel and saying, here's why you're in this condition. If you don't return to the Lord with all your hearts and put away your strange gods and Ashereth among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only, he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So if you remember back from last week, the lesson we covered before when we were in Kings, same thing was going on. They were putting, uh, the, and now the last lesson we were way further up in history. We sort of moved back in, in history chronologically a little bit where these kings were being destroyed because they were worshiping gods up in groves in high places. And this word grove comes up a lot in the Old Testament. God does not like it. And they walk around these groves and they have different statues that they would sort of worship and pray to. <clears throat> we don't see that happening today though, do we? Huh? <laughs> we see a lot of that same thing going on today. And we have to be careful that we don't put other gods before our God. And they can be in many forms, can't they? So he says, you need to repent, basically. Put away these strange gods, because God's not going to support you. And that's what we saw last week. They were hypocrites. They were all thinking they were worshiping God, but they were mixing in other gods, too. And God's not pleased. And so this idea comes out, the inward is more important than the outward. And the inward has to come first. <clears throat> I believe I picked this up out of the commentary, too. <clears throat> so he's, Samuel first calls Israel to return with all their hearts, that inward part. Then outwardly put away these strange gods. Then the Israelites in 7.4, which we've read, covers it. We covered this. We're going to go through a little bit in detail now. They did put away Balaam and Asheroth and served only Jehovah, our God. And the nation repents at Mizpah. Remember, the Philistines are there. They're gathering their armies. And the Israelites don't feel like they're going to win. Then Samuel says, okay, you've done that. Now gather all Israel to Mespah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. How is Samuel acting now? He's acting like a priest. Yes? Is Jehovah used, I guess, as a reference name like God, like to use Yahweh? They're using Jehovah as that name. Yes. God. Yeah, I, I think I'm. Coming up with the King James Version here. Uh, one version is an American standard that might use uh, God. They didn't use Yahweh too much because that was a word they didn't want to even write down. Different versions use different. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it might be the American standard I was in. But yeah, don't, I know we don't use the word Jehovah as much as some groups do, but it's the same name. <clears throat> In verse 6, it says, The Lord, I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together, and Miss Paul drew water, poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. So now we see Samuel acting as prophet. He's heard God back in the temple. He's come in on the scene. Really, he's acting like a king. Now he's, he's gathering Israel forces together. He acts as a priest as he prays the Lord for them. And he's judging them. Samuel judged the children of Israel. 
And Samuel now we see is going to be one of the last judges. So when you read the book of Samuel 1 and 2, you can sort of gather these thoughts together as you're studying this, realizing that he was a judge, priest, king, although he's not named as a king, he's acting like one, and he's one of the last judges. It says his leadership was more than spiritual. It was more than just material, uh, being a material militarily. I didn't end that right, but in 1 Samuel 7 through 7 and 7 through 10, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. Uh, they might be princes or kings or whatever, generals of the army, and they and the children heard it. And they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord. Or we might say, Cease not to pray. Paul says, Pray all the time without ceasing. So that word cry there would mean keep praying. Now they're placing their faith in God instead of their false gods. And then Samuel in verse 9 is acting like a priest here. He actually takes a lamb and offers a burnt sacrifice to the Lord. And then Samuel cries or prays to the Lord, and the Lord hears his prayer. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. Notice what happens. What happens here? What's the Lord do? He thunders with a great thunder on that day. And the version here that I have, it discomforts them. What's that mean by discomfort? I had to look it up. <laughs> Made them uneasy, put them in disarray, caused them to dis be disoriented. I call it Monday morning. Getting ready to go to work sometimes. And so what happens? The, Israel, or the uh, Philistines are subdued. And they came no more within the border of Israel. And this scene is going over and over again. We, we just saw that last week. We're going to continue to see it until God gives up on them. They go away from God, and God allows his enemies to overtake them. Last week, we saw where God actually used the Assyrians to destroy the nation of Israel, the ten tribes. Can anybody see any kind of application of that today for us? Where we start relying on other things besides God and then what would be the circumstances? God hasn't promised us a perfect life here, but I can tell you that when we follow along with what God teaches us, that things are going to go better. We're going to be better off. And that's what the lesson here is in 1 Samuel 7, 13 and 14. The enemies were subdued and the hand of Jehovah took over against the Philistines. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored. Israel took them back from Ekron to Gath. So they pushed the enemies out. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And this peace is a, a thing, too, that with Samuel there on the scene, there's peace. Imagine last week we were looking at the lesson where 
the Israelites were destroyed by the Syrians and they were on the doorsteps of the, of the nation of Judah. Can you concentrate? Can you worship? Can you study when that all is going on? Can you evangelize the lost? So that's one of the reasons we pray for peace. We pray for this nation. We pray for our leaders. We can't do anything if there's discontent, war. And I was thinking about this as I was studying this lesson. I, I think I heard something about this on uh, radio that <clears throat> some of these stations I listen to while I'm driving my truck around. This idea that if you look at the time we're in right now in history, we don't have a king. We don't have a dictator. But just look a couple hundred years ago, what did we escape from? What did our forefathers of this country escape from? A king, right? And if you look at the countries even around the world today, what are they led by? They might not call them kings, but we might call them despots. They're leaders, they're rulers. And there's not freedom there, is there? And so really, we live in a unique time in history, and that's kind of what's going on here. Samuel, I looked up the definition. God heard, or the name of God. And Samuel becomes rule, ruling judge. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, God calls him and he says, here I am. Here I am, Lord. What would you have me to do? If you go back at 1 Samuel chapter 3, that's the, inter the, that's the occasion. Here we are, Lord. What would you have us to do? Would be an application for us. He goes on. He's going to be the one then that anoints Saul and David. Remember when Michael was teaching, we went back and looked at that lesson too, where imagine being... Uh, David's family and having Samuel show up at the tent door and looking for that ruddy boy that's out tending the sheep. So by this time, Samuel, when Samuel arrives on the scene, uh, we might say people are quaking in their boots. What's David's father's name? I got a mental blank. Jesse. Jesse. When, when Samuel shows up and talks to Jesse, thank you. <laughs> and the, Jesse's probably thinking, where's my oldest son? Because that would be the tradition. But God, through Samuel, is looking for David. And David was, what kind of heart did he have? After God's, after God's own heart. He had, a, he had a heart after God's own heart. And we might say Samuel is the same thing here. When we have a, God, a, a, God, a heart after God, we're going to listen to what he says and obey. I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but I think these are some of the applications that we should be uh, looking at. Any comments so far? Can anybody, everybody hear me? Okay. Next section on uh, page 15, we're in the Samuel and a king. So Samuel establishes himself as king, prophet, judge, really, priest. And he, he goes on for a while, but something's going to happen here to Samuel. And we're going to look at that next. I threw this in here. I was looking at studying some of this. As we looked at judges, compare Samuel, spiritually minded, to Samson. Most of you probably remember the story of Samson. We studied that story out of these books a few years ago. Samuel started trusting too much in himself. I remember somebody cut his hair off. But who was more effective leading Israel in victory over their enemies? Their enemies. Well, if you study it, it's Samuel. 
And there's also peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel was not only a successful man of war, but he was a success, successful man of peace. And that's what they were striving for. And before we go in that next section, Samuel's service as a circuit judge, and we had that in the colonial times in this country. And that's what these judges would do. They would move around into different areas of the territory and judge the people against the word of God. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. <clears throat> he went from year to year as a circuit between Bethel, Gigal, and Mespah and judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. There he judged Israel, and he built an altar to the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 7, 15 through 17. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 through 5, <clears throat> it came to pass when Samuel was old, we'll get a little background here, that he made his sons judges over Israel. And it talks about the firstborn Joel and Abba. But they had not walked in verse 3 in the ways. In other words, they didn't obey God. They turned aside over to their own ideas, took bribes, perverted judgment. Then even the elders of Israel noticed this. And they come to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you're old, and your sons don't walk in the ways of a judge. We want a king. And this we get into 1 Samuel chapter uh, 12. Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I've hearkened your voice. I heard you. We're skipping a couple chapters up. <clears throat> I've heard you say, and I've made a king over you now. So remember 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 8, 5, where we're looking at here. We want to be just, we want a king like other nations. Although Samuel was acting like a king, he was getting old and he had put his sons in place and they weren't acting right. And I think it's peculiar to notice here that the elders of the Israel nation came to him. So that speaks something about Samuel and what he was doing. So in other words, the application here for us today, we always say, if we say something from up here, come to, come to us and let's get down, let's let's get down and look at it together. Correct one another. We're not above that. I appreciate if you don't call me out up here, but let's get together and talk about it if I say something wrong. Once I'm way out of line, then Mary will come up and grab me. But we do those kind of things. This is what's happening here, I think. These elders are coming up to Samuel saying, this isn't right, and that's refreshing to see. And in verse 3, he says, I'm a witness before the Lord. I'm before his anointed. What ox have I taken? What donkey have I taken, whom I've defrauded, whom I've oppressed? So Samuel sort of takes it personal. But they said, you've not defrauded us. You've not oppressed us. You've not taken anything out of our hand. So he sort of gets the idea here that something's going on. <clears throat> First Samuel 7 uh, 15, we, we see where he was an extraordinary judge. In verse 33 of, verse, of chapter 15, <clears throat> we see that Samuel is going to anoint a king like they asked. And so I'm skipping around, picking up verses here that uh, I believe also come up in your commentary that show this transfer, even though Samuel had a little bit of trouble with it, 
he goes on and here's their wishes. And we, we saw a couple studies back where there was an exchange between God and Samuel. And I think it's in 1 Samuel chapter 8 where God says, let these things be so. Samuel reminds the people in verse 6 of chapter 12 that it's the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt. This again is a common thread throughout the Old Testament where God constantly reminds his people who saved them from the bondage of Pharaoh. And we do the same thing as we take the communion once a week to remind ourselves who removes us from the bondage of sin. It's God through his son. It is Jehovah that in the Hebrew, Jehovah is absolutely, or God, or Lord, is put absolutely without any government <clears throat> that Septuagint rightly applies, supplies as witness. In other words, <clears throat> Jeho- Samuel says, I'm the witness to God. And in verse 5, he said unto them, The Lord is the witness against you, and his anointed is the witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. So in other words, God is being acknowledged as the true author of their faith, that Samuel is a witness to what God would have him know to tell the people, and he wants to make sure that they acknowledge that God is the one that they're to hear. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, 1 through 7, we're still in that section. It brings up chapter 12, 20 through, through 25. I'm using the King James Version here. I think it's the American standard to use the Jehovah. Only the fear of the Lord serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if you shall do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. So this is Samuel warning them after he brings on Saul. And this is exactly what happens, isn't it? As we looked at last week's lesson, as we study our Bibles, we know that they become divided. And together we stand and divided we fall. So Samuel does what he's asked to do. He anoints a king. Saul, remember we said he was around, they think he was over six foot. He was the, after man's own heart. Samuel takes a vial of oil and pours it out over his head, kissed him, and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Excuse me. So there's a rhetorical question here. Later on, we saw, and we saw this last uh, study session or last semester, we see that in verse one, uh, 11 through 12 in chapter 15, God says, it repent to me. I'm sorry that I've set up Saul to be king, for he turns his back on me. And we're kind of looking back here again, getting a little refresher of last semester, last study period. <clears throat> but we remember this whole story where Saul falls out of the favor of the Lord because he did not heed to the Lord. 
<clears throat> and so then Samuel anoints David. We saw that last study. So I think the idea here is they just want to show, or this commentary wants us to point out the idea that Samuel made kings through God of Saul and of David. <clears throat> I didn't go into in the end of this section here we read it <clears throat> again this, this kind of confuses me but it, it concludes with this story of how David or Jonathan protects David from the wrath of Saul and later on David restores that favor when he was king he didn't pursue Jonathan in the house of Saul which normally kings would do they would destroy the previous king's household but we just we look at that last uh, period <clears throat> so that last section on page 15 they bring that in we just studied that last quarter I don't exactly understand But Samuel's success as Israel's leader can be attributed to his spiritual faithfulness. And in James chapter 4.10, reminds us of how we follow the word of God today. But we're to humble ourselves, not let our pride get in the way of the Lord, and he will lift you up. <clears throat> Much of Saul's ministry found him functioning as a prophet, as a leader of Israel. He ends up being Saul's spiritual advisor. We don't see him advising David as much, although he anoints him. And his work is going to parallel what we see coming up in Isaiah, advising the kings of Judah. But I would uh, add on to that, and this is out of your commentary, these prophets will advise all these kings, and most of the time these prophets are saying, you're doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So that's kind of the lesson. Has anybody got any more <laughs> comments there before we move into questions? I think the idea, again, is to sort of set Samuel up as a prophet. And uh, as we start working into Isaiah, we'll better appreciate Isaiah as a prophet, which we're going to finally get into next lesson. Okay, we'll go with a lightning round of questions. Question, David. I know we have no prophets today. And the visions that people say they have now, and they've been here and gone there, we miscount them. But in the Bible, it said in the end times, it says your children will dream and have visions and prophesy. Now, what are they talking about there in the end times? I might be confused, or what are they visioning? What are they, do you know? Well, hold on that thought, Gene. You can answer that? Or do you have a different question? Do what? You know, hold on, hold on to your thought. I think what he's, you're talking about the end times, the last days, we're talking about in the New Testament. In Acts, you'll see that there's prophets, even prophet, even women prophets, that are still testifying to confirm the word of the Lord as it hadn't been completely written down. So we, we have to always keep in context, is your end times and the Bible's end times or another word for that term, synonymously speaking, is in the last days. And if you look in Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 1 through 3, as we just covered, God says, in the last days I'll speak to you through my son. But what we see in the first century, the New Testament church, these confirmations were brought on by people. Even when Zechariah brings and Elizabeth bring John, the baby, in to be uh, uh, 
ceremoniously circumcised in the, in the church, in the temple. I believe that's what happened. A prophet, it says, this is from God. I think that's what they're talking about there. Okay. Jean? Okay, my question is, I guess I should ask the sooner, was back on verse 6 when they said that they poured out the water to God. God's not in their presence. This is just a significance. Yeah, I think uh, if I remember what you're, we're looking at the scriptures. In verse 6, 7, 6. 7, 6. Yeah, we read those scriptures. I believe you're on page 12. <clears throat> and they said they poured it out before Jehovah mm -hmm. and fasted on that day. Yeah, I think those are all ways of those, of their repenting, recognizing where their blessings really come from. Because God's never in their presence, right? Not the way he is today. Uh, he's, he's, he's in a presence through Samuel the prophet, but they're doing these things to repent to him. He can see them. Yeah. No problem. I hope I've answered your ideas here. We, what did Samuel call for the Israelites to do in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3? This is the first question in your book. I'm sorry? Well, that's what he wanted to do, rid them all of their... False gods and yeah, they give back to your pour the water, all these pour the sackcloth, all these things were signs. These were physical outward signs, but God was looking for an inward change first, and that's what this says. Is Samuel saying, with all your hearts? Where did Samuel gather together? First Samuel chapter seven five. Mizpah. Yeah, in Mizpah. This is the site of a big battle. How the Philistines respond to Israel's prayer? 1 Samuel 7 7. They came up to attack them. They went up and attacked them. And what happened to Samuel when he offered a burnt offering? What did God do, I guess it would be the question. He made a loud thunder. Yeah. What happens, yeah. The Lord thunder. Yeah. And here's where I, I remember looking up this just comforting word and a uh, better uh, translation in our understanding would be put them in disarray. <clears throat> We've talked about this, it comes to my mind too before. Whenever you hear the word of God, actually coming out from God, it would cause disarray. What did Samuel ask the Israelites at Saul's coronation? Whose ox had he taken? Whose donkey did he take? Mm -hmm. Who had he cheated, oppressed, yeah. accepted, a bride from? Seems like Samuel took this sort of personal, but they're saying it's not. <clears throat> it's not you were responding to. It's your sons. And remind, Samuel reminds the people regarding the Lord. He says in 6 and 7, The Lord has advanced you. He advanced Moses and Aaron. He's brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> what did David ask Jonathan to do? Show kindness. Show kindness. Do a calling with thy servant. And we went through that whole lesson. <clears throat> what did Jonathan promise? Well, he'd round up his father and find out what his intentions mm -hmm. was, whether mm -hmm. it was good or bad. Yeah. And again, I don't know why this comes up. We studied this. Michael brought this up when he taught the class, this whole situation there. But Okay, we're running away past time. Ooh, we are. Yeah, we are. Sorry about that. Isaiah chapter 1, 1 through 23 last week. Next week, Lord willing. Thank you.